male humpback whale, a singer. His complex and haunting song can be heard for miles underwater. Humpback migrations are legendary, epics of time and distance. These whales and others were hunted to the brink of extinction. But since a 1986 whaling moratorium, a few species, including humpbacks, have recovered some of their historic numbers. But whaling nations want to reopen the hunt. Japan currently kills whales in a controversial and lethal research program. In the Antarctic, massive factory ships stalk minke and fin whales. Now, they've announced their intentions to target humpbacks. You're in a whale sanctuary and you're assisting in illegal activity. Remove yourself from these waters immediately. Captain Paul Watson of the Sea Shepherd Society has made it his personal mission to shut down the whaling industry. In the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary, Watson and his teams chase, harass, and ram Japanese ships. They're heroes to many, pirates and eco-terrorists to others. Nations such as Tonga are being recruited to take sides with pro-whaling nations at the International Whaling Commission. But Tonga also has a fledgling whale watching industry. And whale watching is a very popular and lucrative business, especially in the Hawaiian Islands. In winter months, humpbacks are Maui's number one tourist attraction. At Maui's Whale Quest, Photographers, researchers, and conservation groups gather at an annual conference dedicated to humpback whales. There's no doubt the animals stir our emotions like no other creatures. whales breaching, jaw-dropping acrobatic feats. These are the warm cobalt blue waters of Tonga, an island nation in the South Pacific. Humpbacks gather here to mate, give birth, and to rear their young. For months, adult whales do not eat Females lose much of their body mass while nursing their enormous offspring. From the tropics, humpbacks then travel thousands of miles to rich feeding grounds in colder seas of both hemispheres. Considering they haven't eaten for half a year, it's a tremendous migration. They undertake this arduous journey for good reason. Whether it's krill in the Antarctic or herring in Alaska, humpback whales need to consume a lot of food before their return voyage.
hunted for centuries, whales fueled our insatiable appetites for oil, blubber, and countless consumer products. The slow-moving animals were no match for swift whaling vessels. With the advent of even faster, more modern ships equipped with explosive harpoons, hundreds of thousands of whales were killed. It eventually became clear that many species, including humpbacks, were in grave trouble. A global moratorium stopped the commercial hunt in the mid-1980s. And in 1994, the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary was formed in the waters surrounding Antarctica. In the decades since the moratorium, humpbacks and a few other species have rebounded in numbers. With many commercial fish stocks on the verge of collapse, there is a growing movement to once again target whales, this time mainly for their meat, literally tons of nutritious, protein-rich flesh from a single animal. The ban on hunting whales is still in place, but through a loophole, whales can be killed for scientific or research purposes. Japan is one of the leaders. The merits and legitimacy of this lethal research are hotly debated. Critics denounce Japan's scientific program as a front for renewed commercial hunting of whales. The Japanese counter that relatively plentiful and smaller minke whales that were not historically targeted are fair game. But the most contentious issue in the debate is that the animals are currently hunted in a protected area, the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary, where whaling is banned. And directly in their wake trying to stop them is the Sea Shepherd Society. I set up a Sea Shepherd Uphold International Conservation Laws, Treaties and Regulations. So we intervene where there's uh, criminal operations taking pl place, illegal whaling, illegal fishing, and that's what we've been uh, specializing in over the years. So we're not a protest organization. A respected and equally reviled activist, Watson has been instrumental in raising public awareness on many environmental issues. He developed his extreme form of activism at a very early age. I was raised in a fishing village in New Brunswick and I began to walk the trap lines and free the uh, beavers and the other animals and uh, then I began to destroy the traps and so that's where my activism started at 11. And then uh, in 1969, at 18, I was the youngest founding member of Greenpeace. On dry land for just a few months each year, Watson, now a U.S. citizen, bases his operations on San Juan Island in Washington State. Alongside annual campaigns against Canada's sealing industry, Sea Shepherd now directs much of their attention towards Japanese whaling in Antarctica. In the austral summer, hundreds of thousands of whales migrate to Antarctica countless marine mammals gather in these frigid seas to feed. This is the Sea Shepherd vessel, the Robert Hunter. Its mission, to hunt down Japanese whaling ships. I had been wanting to go down and confront the Japanese fleet for years, but it wasn't until 2002 that we were able to afford our first campaign to go down there. And uh, we just completed this year our fourth campaign to Antarctica. And it's proven to be more successful every year. Our tactic's pretty simple. We just simply uh, chase them and they run and they don't kill whales. So they're only able to get half their quota over the last two years. I like to design tactics that aren't going to hurt anybody and are somewhat humorous. And so, you know, in the past we've had uh, cannons that fire pie filling, chocolate or cream pie, and you know, you can certainly slime somebody with 45 gallons of chocolate. We're always constantly trying to come up with tactics that are designed to be effective, yet at the same time will not injure anybody that we're opposing. Japanese don't view Paul Watson's tactics as humorous and are definitely not amused. 
Smoke and stink bombs are just one of the many ways in which Sea Shepherd disrupts the operations of whaling ships. For weeks, even months at a time, Sea Shepherd teams search for Japanese ships. And the Antarctic is a massive territory to cover. Confrontations are rare and generally fleeting, but when they do encounter whalers, all hell breaks loose. Kaiko Maru, this is the Robert Hunter. You've been identified as an illegal whaling vessel. We strongly advise that you leave the Southern Ocean's Whale Sanctuary immediately. This is not a protest action, this is a law enforcement action. Pack up your bags and head back to Japan or we will shut you down. Sea Shepherd utilizes many tactics in their mission to stop whaling ships. One of the more dangerous techniques is propeller fouling. Middle of an action, dude. Okay. Nice, nice he's done. Nice. You got a line around that prop? <laughs> yeah, right on. Uh, that prop fowler is really in there too. It's really turning around with the prop. You can see it swirling with the prop wash. Very nice. We uh, get volunteers from around the world and we uh, interview them. The one question that we sit down and ask them is, are you willing to risk your life to protect a whale? And uh, if they say no, then we don't want it. People risk their lives and kill other people over real estate and oil wells. I think it's a far more noble thing to risk your life over protection of an endangered species or a threatened habitat. I believe that we should save the whales because uh, whales and dolphins are very intelligent uh, animals. I think they're worth saving, that's why I'm down here. But we also give a very clear uh, message to the Japanese fleet that we're in not Greenpeace, we're not a protest organization. We're uh, capable of doing a lot more and we want to stop them, to shut down their illegal operation, because that's what it is. As long as they run from us, as long as we're in their slipstream, as long as we're on their tail following them, they can't kill whales. And they know that, so they'll always try to get away from us. Smoke them! Smoke them! Smoke and stink bombs severely disrupt activities on the Japanese ships. The flensing decks can be rendered inoperative until they are thoroughly cleaned. One of the more noxious substances is butyric acid, which is found in rancid butter, vomit, and body odor. It really smells. When all else fails to send the whalers packing, a final and very controversial technique is to bump or even ram them. Go ahead, dead ahead. 40. Who rammed who in this January 2007 incident is still being debated, and both sides claim the other is at fault. Check out damage, please. Any people checking the damage? Tackle Maru, this is the Robert Hunter. This is not a protest action, this is a law enforcement action. Holy shit, look at the chip. It's pretty automated, okay? Uh... Take 20. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Engine stop. The Japanese did indeed issue a May Day. This wouldn't be the first or the last international incident in Sea Shepherd's Antarctic campaigns. SS whale meat, uh, please uh, remove yourself from these waters. You're in violation of international conservation regulations. We're acting in accordance with the United Nations World Charter for Nature and implementing these regulations. You're in a whale sanctuary and you're assisting in illegal activity. Remove yourself from these waters immediately. Hey! 
Teams on board Sea Shepherd's second ship, the Robert Hunter, confronted the main factory ship, the Nishin Maru. In the next campaign, a Sea Shepherd team attempted a very risky maneuver, boarding a factory ship. The two Sea Shepherd crew members were held briefly by the Japanese. They were eventually turned over to Australian officials who had helped negotiate their release. Back on board their own ship, they were greeted as heroes. The 2008 campaign would eventually take a darker turn. Sea Shepherd teams again threw stink bombs onto the deck of the Nishin Maru. But this time, the Japanese fought back. Armed guards tossed flash grenades at the Sea Shepherd crew. Watson, who always wears a bulletproof vest, may have been shot. Hit me right here. He's been hit by a bullet. Go as fast as I can. Yeah, I see him. Sea Shepherd's future campaigns will no doubt be controversial and confrontational. Every single marine mammal on this planet is endangered. Not only that, most of the fish are endangered. Every single commercial fishery is in a state of collapse. The oceans are dying. And so uh, we've got to stop this massive exploitation of wild species. I think that we have to have a complete moratorium on raping the oceans. Uh, because it's just out of control, there's simply too many people and there's not enough fish and animals in the sea to continue to support this incredibly rapacious appetite that we've developed. Whether you agree or disagree with Sea Shepherd's tactics or their politics, they are, if anything, highly effective activists. There are alternatives to killing whales. Whale watching is a very lucrative business. A live whale can be worth far more than a dead one. This is Lahaina's Whale Row. Dozens of businesses geared to tourists line the waterfront. The main attraction here, whale watching. Everybody ready to see some whales? Yeah! yeah! Let's go! Each day in winter, hundreds of eager tourists crowd the waterfront, vying for space on a handful of whale watching boats. Whale watching boats of all shapes and sizes head into the channel between Maui and Lanai in search of humpbacks. My name is Nate. I'm going to be your naturalist on the mic telling you what we're looking for out there today in North Pacific humpback whale. The main thing I think is so great about ecotourism 
is it gives a chance to people to get as close to these animals as legally and ethically possible. We get to take people out here and uh, show them these whales, you know, literally the, probably the biggest thing they'll ever see in their lifetime. This is definitely the, the biggest tourist attraction here on Maui. Uh, I believe yesterday we had 492 people out. Uh, we're trying to break the record. Our, our goal is to get 500 people out here in one day. Favorites of everyone, crew and guests alike, are the small calves. We got a spy hopping calf. A little head lunge that turned into a spy hop. Guys, he was looking at us. His eyes were just as well out of the water. He's checking us out. Welcome to a Maui mugging where you don't have to worry about your wallets. Now, another cool thing about watching these calves is they do have smaller lungs, so they aren't down that long. There's a no one ever seems to tire of Hawaii's most famous seasonal residence. I love it. You know, the more time you spend out here, um, sorry, excuse me. Oh. Whales up, nine o'clock. <laughs> the more you do it, the more you realize how magical this is, and and to have a close encounter with the whale. Even for those of us that do this, I drive 14 charters a week. Um, to have that experience is just absolutely unbelievable. Before long, it's time to head back to the harbor to pick up yet another group of tourists. Make no mistake, this business makes a lot of money. It breaks my heart, but we do have to start heading back towards Lahaina. So nothing makes whales fly out of the water faster than heading for home, so do keep an eye out behind us. Did you guys have a good time out there today? That's what we like to hear. Well, uh, she's absolutely right. Private whale watching charters also depart from many of the island's waterfront resorts. Welcome aboard, guys. Go ahead and follow that down. Go ahead, guys. There she blows, 4 o'clock. There's another group, 3 o'clock. Every group you're seeing right now is mother calf escorts. It's very difficult to describe the experience of whale watching. The animals trigger a strong emotional response in most people. There's just something magical about a close encounter with one of Hawaii's humpbacks. Whales are amazing. You never appreciate them until you see them up close and get to experience their beauty and the size of them and hear the sounds. And it's really amazing. <laughs> this is my favorite time of year. It's nice to have them here. What goes on in the lives of whales? Well, we're always curious about the unknown. I think maybe that's one of the strengths of being a human being, that the unknown is a challenge. And it's a, also a source of attraction and focus. And so here you have this gigantic animal that's bigger than anything that you've got on Earth, and yet you realize you don't know anything about it. You don't love things that you don't value, and you don't value things that you don't know. Whale watching is an avenue uh, to getting to know something which will lead to getting to value it, which will lead to being concerned with saving it. Look at, look at these whale soup books. There's, there's three or four here. Okay, there's one of the males, so the other two are probably to the left of him. Deep below the surface, a male humpback calls out to other whales. Singers have long fascinated 
and perplexed whale researchers. What exactly are humpbacks trying to say? Canadian scientist Dr. Jim Darling spends the winter months in Maui studying humpback whales. Each day, weather permitting, Darling and other researchers depart from Lahaina's harbor. Hawaii's humpbacks are one of the world's most heavily studied cetaceans, but there are still many unanswered questions about their behavior, especially their iconic songs. Humpback whales spend the summer feeding all around the Pacific Rim from Northern California to Northern Japan. In the winter, they migrate to breeding grounds in tropical waters, subtropical waters like Hawaii. The males are here to mate. The females have two roles when they're here. One is to mate, and the other is to give birth and nurse. Whale researchers in Hawaii have made an encouraging discovery. Humpback numbers are definitely on the rise. Population in the North Pacific is uh, increasing and increasing quite quickly. You know, since we started looking at whales here in the mid-70s, there's just no question that the numbers have at least quadrupled in this area. And uh, all indications are is that the population is continuing to increase in numbers and is beginning to re-inhabit traditional ranges which were empty for decades after whaling. So in the present, right now, it appears that this particular population of whales is doing relatively well. Darling motors around the channel looking for signs of humpbacks, specifically lone animals. Surprisingly, it's only the males that sing. We've learned over the years that most singers are alone. They're lone males, and so, uh, you know, if we're traveling along and we see any single blows, you sort of go over there just to check, because the odds are greater that they're singing than, than if whales are in groups. The songs are so loud, they can be felt through the boat's hull. We know that humpback males sing during the breeding season. The song is somewhat unique in the sense that it, uh, it's a series of sounds which is repeated over and over, sort of every 10 or 15 minutes, and the song changes as it's being sung, it sort of gradually evolves as it's being sung. All the singers in a population sing the same version at any one time. So we've been attempting to understand what's going on. Why are they singing? What, what's the function? How does it work? I mean, what's the purpose of it all? It's clearly a fairly important part of their breeding you know, behavior because it's, I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, you can't put your head in the water here without hearing song any time from December through April. The greatest misconception about whale song is that it's males singing to attract females for mating purposes, and uh, that idea has been around for you know several decades. The problem is, is that no one has ever seen a female attracted to a singer. Singers sing until other lone adults come and join them, but those other lone adults are other males. So we listen to the song, and there's a part of the song where it usually just precedes them coming up, and. Uh, you listen until it comes to that part of the song, and then you start looking around for whoever surfaces. Before song recordings can be analyzed, the singers have to be identified. Each whale has a distinct tail fluke, much like a human fingerprint. I mean, we always like to know which individual is, is attached to the song. Uh, we may be comparing songs of uh, different individuals, or we may uh, have repeat sightings of this guy, and we want to see how his uh, specific song has changed over time. Uh, we also ID him because uh, we may see him in different groups through the day. There's quite a bit of interaction going on here between the uh, two males and the mother and calf probably trying to stay out of the way. A 
Pai and a handful of others around the world have been working on the song issue for what amounts to decades now. And, uh, you know, we're getting closer. We're beginning to understand a little bit about the song. It is a puzzle. You just want to see uh, how close you can come to solving it. Jim Darling and others in the whale research community are very alarmed at news of humpbacks possibly being targeted by whalers. Hawaii's whales do not travel to Antarctica and would not be hunted, but there's concern that renewed commercial whaling would make its way eventually to the North Pacific. Many humpbacks, like these animals at play, have no fear of people or boats. They would make easy targets for whalers. There is no question in my mind whatsoever that we don't have the, the kind of information that we should have to open any kind of whaling quotas on humpback whales. I mean, we have some vague idea of numbers in some areas, but we know virtually nothing of their social system or behavior, population definition, and so on. And until we know those things, any kind of whaling is just a huge gamble. Researchers and whale watchers are not the only people concerned with the welfare of humpbacks. Photographers and filmmakers have long held a deep fascination with these enigmatic animals. Renowned artists such as David Fleetham, David Dubalay, and Flip Nicklin are strong opponents to the prospects of renewed commercial whaling. And at Maui's Whale Quest, these photographers, scientists, and conservation groups all gather for an annual conference dedicated to humpback whales. Still, photographer David Fleetham has a special affinity for humpback whales. A Maui resident for over 20 years, Fleetham has encountered more than his fair share of whales. He finally recalls one of his first experiences with a humpback. Down in the South Pacific was the first place I saw one underwater. They're so enormous, it's like a huge bus swimming around underwater. It really takes your breath away. It's hard to believe that anything alive is that big. One whale stayed underneath our boat for uh, probably about four hours. We stopped and had lunch, so, which if anybody told me I was gonna be eating a sandwich, and as a humpback whale was swimming around my boat, I would've told them they were nuts. When you slipped into the water, it would immediately swim straight over to you, and it would hold its pectoral fin out and wave it only just a few feet in front of your face. I have no idea what the whale was trying to tell me. Finally, I, I was like, well, I have that shot, and I have that shot. And so I started getting as tight as I could, and I got a shot of the tubercles. Around their jaw on the top and the bottom of their head are bumps, and each bump contains a hair and for the first time, I actually got a shot where you can see the hair in the, uh, in the tubercle. When humpbacks sing, the sound is so loud, you can hear it before you even get in the water. It reverberates through the hull. And once you get in the water, there's some low sounds that they make where you actually get shaken underwater by it. The first time that I ever free dove down onto a singer, the sound was so loud I couldn't hold my breath. I ended up coming back up and going, all right, calm down, take a few deep breaths, and then dive back down. The singers are phenomenal. Fleetum shares the concerns of many that renewed commercial hunting of whales, especially humpbacks, is a grave mistake. It seems that to begin whaling again at this point in time is ridiculous. The whales have been protected for so long. In the 20 years that I've been in Hawaii, I hear more and more of encounters between boats and whales, friendly encounters, where the whales approach the boat and they stay around the boat. But the whales, I think, are just getting more and more acclimatized to people and boats and have no fear of them. To now begin hunting them is like hunting bears in Yellowstone Park. The humpback has just now reached the point where it's a question whether or not it is still an endangered species. To, at this point, go out and be killing them it just seems ridiculous. We just barely got through possibly saving them. Historically, 
man's capability of even managing a fishery is hopeless. You know, we target one species until they're gone, and then we hit another species until they're gone. So to put something that we've just now saved back on the, uh, the killing list is, to me, ludicrous. Smell that power. Kapalua's Whale Quest Conference, a diverse group of artists, researchers, and conservation groups gather to celebrate Hawaii's most famous cetaceans. Scientists like Dr. Jim Darling present some of their most recent findings to an eager public. Everyone here, it seems, loves humpback whales. Whale Quest is a three-day event that we put on every year to help try to bring the research community together with the public so that we can share what we're learning about whales and try to get everyone as excited as we are about what we have right here in our backyard. We have up to 60% of the North Pacific population of humpbacks coming here every year. What we want to do is share that information with as many people as we can and get it out. And Whale Quest Kapalua is one way that we can do that. So we try to incorporate and include people that are looking at the ocean, that are passionate about the ocean from a number of different perspectives, from photography, from videography, cinematography, as well as the science, because it's really that combination of all those things that will lead, to hopefully, people becoming inspired and getting excited about conservation. The size of these creatures in the water is extraordinary. It's that wonderful majesty to a whale. It's a presence that uh, is unknown on this planet. There is no other animal that has that enormous, silent, and absolutely graceful presence. Whale Quest is a chance for local researchers and supporters to present to the community what we're doing and what we're learning in their backyard. And it's a chance for the community to support research that's important. If we don't know about the animals, then the pictures don't mean anything. If you don't know about the animals, then you can't do education. If you don't know about the animals, you can't make good conservation decisions. And so there's a tie between the research, the story, the presentation, and education. No one part works without the other. During Whale Quest, Flip Nicklin, David Dubelay, and other participants also get to become whale-watching tourists. Calf's gonna come up right here. Here comes the calf. Here she comes, right here. Whale watching and whale tourism, like this, these animals are completely relaxed, they're playing around the boat, you know, uh, you've got a captain that knows what the heck he's doing with the whole thing, and uh, how can you beat this? You know, it's wonderful, it'll change everybody on this boat and what their attitudes are towards the humpback whale. That's a tremendous positive thing. Images have become really uh, the way that our society preserves memories and for photographers like myself, like, like Flip, like David, are there whales behind me? <laughs> <laughs> um, we have been charged with uh, documenting the changing of our planet and, and to maybe keep a record of what's happening. Photographers are really some of the people that are in the front lines of conservation. While Hawaii's and other Pacific whale species are heavily protected, humpbacks in other regions are not so lucky. This calf is now large enough and strong enough to make the arduous journey south from the warm waters of Tonga to the frigid seas of Antarctica. The future of these whales is uncertain. There are now less than 800 humpbacks in Tongan waters. And if commercial whaling resumes, they will be on the front lines of the hunt. The sheltered waters of the South Pacific nation of Tonga have been important breeding grounds for humpback whales for millennia. These islands used to teem with the animals, maybe 10,000 or more, before modern whaling. Only about 250 survived the whaling era. Many nations participated in the slaughter. KGB documents revealed that Russian whaling ships illegally killed more than 48,000 whales in the Southern Pacific in just two decades. 
the former king of Tonga was so concerned with the welfare of the country's remaining whales that he implemented a complete prohibition on whaling in the late 70s. In the past few decades, Tonga's humpbacks have recovered slightly to perhaps seven or 800 animals. But Tonga's, Fiji's, and Australia's humpback whales all migrate to Antarctica to feed. Two years ago in St. Kitts at the International Whaling Commission meeting, the pro-whaling nations held a majority. And the current situation with Japanese and whaling is that they have a scientific research program where they announced they were gonna take 935 minke whales, 50 fin whales, and 50 humpback whales. Humpback whales are endangered or threatened depending on the population you're looking at. And this happened to be a population that migrated past the coast of Australia. Through pressure by Australia and possibly some sort of backroom discussions with the United States, Japan withdrew its quota of 50 humpback whales, focusing on the 935 minke whales and the 50 fin whales. Two years ago, the Japanese announced that they were going to be targeting humpback whales, and I think really that they did this in order to put it on the table so they could always withdraw it to get what they wanted. They wanted a higher quota of uh, minke whales and fin whales. And every time they feel like they're not getting their way, they throw them back on the table. They're going to be doing this again this year. The humpback has really been the bargaining chip that they've been using to get their way down in Antarctica. The Japanese argue that there are more than enough minke whales to sustain a well-managed whaling industry. Critics argue that even considering legalizing commercial whaling may open the floodgates to an all-out slaughter. A new legal whaling industry would likely spawn illegal pirate operations that would make no distinction between species, endangered or not. But to resume whaling, the moratorium would first have to be lifted. The Japanese are courting countries like uh, Tonga and Mongolia and Chad and uh, St. Lucia, any country that they can get that will vote their way. It's a real fear that, uh, of course, Tonga would sell out to the Japanese, just like, you know, Mongolia is now a part of the International Whaling Commission, even though they don't have an ocean, but Japan pays all of their expenses. Japan's an economic bully, and it gets in there and says, OK, uh, you know, we're going to cut trade agreements with you if you don't do what we want. I'm not really concerned about it too much because Japan's not going to get a two-thirds majority at the International Whaling Commission. They're just not going to do it. And that's the only way they're going to overturn that moratorium is with a two-thirds majority. Japan is an island nation and they see the world in a different way. They traditionally have gotten a huge proportion of their food from the ocean. I can understand their position that you know, they need to feed themselves and they have a right to feed themselves. However, with whaling, it's not simply a matter of numbers. If there's a half a million whales, we can go out and kill a certain proportion of them. It is how that half a million whales are distributed in the ocean, how isolated they are from one another. There's a lot of questions there that need to be answered before you can scientifically say that you can sustainably harvest that population. The idea of harvesting a natural resource is can you do it, which is a scientific question, and should you do it, which is a moral ethical question. And I don't think the science part has been answered yet. The moral and ethical part of that equation, I think, is always going to be a bone of contention between pro-whalers and anti-whalers. The growth of whale watching tourism has been spectacular. It now occurs in almost 100 countries. It's estimated to generate in excess of a billion dollars each year. And even minke whales are popular tourist attractions. Whale watching is the ultimate sustainable industry. You're not doing anything to harm the whales. You can keep people going out and seeing whales year after year after year. It brings money into local economies. And these small South Pacific islands, Tonga, for example, I would love to go to Tonga to go whale watching, and I know a lot of my friends would. But the idea that these whales are also being hunted would make me less apt to go to a country like that to go whale watching. This year, the Japanese again announced a self-awarded quota of 50 humpback whales. And yet again, they canceled the plans after closed-door negotiations at the International Whaling Commission. 
Can whale watching tourism help save humpbacks and other whales? Perhaps. For now, humpbacks are still protected, but it may be just a matter of time before the whaling moratorium is lifted. <laughs>